I'd like to formally welcome you to Old Pueblo Archaeology Center's third Thursday Food for Thought program. For those of you that are just tuning in, my name is Monica Young, and I am president for Old Pueblo Archaeology Center in Tucson, a nonprofit organization that is bringing you this presentation. For tonight's third Thursday program, Old Pueblo is delighted to welcome our guest presenter, archaeologist Carl Lumbaugh. Mr. Lumbaugh has informed us that he was raised on a ranch located between Springer and Cimarron in far northeastern New Mexico. And he is a graduate of New Mexico State University, and he pursued an archaeological career in southern New Mexico, or has pursued this career in southern New Mexico since 1974. Carl has directed projects for the New Mexico State University Contract Archaeology Program for nine years until 1983, when he joined HSR, the Human Systems Research Nonprofit Organization, one of the Southwest's first archaeological research and cultural resource management groups. After serving as H HSR's executive director for 10 years, he continued and will retire as its associate director and principal investigator. In this presentation this evening, Carl will discuss HSR's major archaeological research project that he directed in La Cañada Alamosa, an area in western New Mexico occupied by people of both the northern Mogollon and southern ancestral Pueblo cultures. Please welcome this month's Third Thursday Food for Thought guest speaker, Mr. Carl Lumba. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah, go ahead and go to full screen, please. Full screen. From beginning would be good. There we go. All right, you're on. Okay, very good. Well, welcome everyone and and thank you, uh, Al Dart and Monica Young, and and a big thank you to Old Pueblo Archaeology for presenting these webinars and and helping the process of sharing the wonderful archaeology of the Southwest uh, to a lot of folks. And I want to thank the audience for for tuning in. And many of you have had some sort of association with this project or have followed it through the years. Uh, it started in 1999, so we're now in our 25th year, and um, it's 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 been quite a deal, and it's multifaceted. Uh, I can't begin to talk about all of it in in any any one outing. So the first slides uh, are, are essentially an introduction to to this to this project, and then we'll 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 get in on the on the talk, which which is actually a distillation of of 25 years of work and and data supporting one of the various hypotheses that we proposed when we started this. Um, in in uh, in 1999, the project started. Uh, had a phone call from uh, Dr. Dennis O'Toole, and it led us into this canyon where we'd been before. He had found a report that. Uh, that I had written in conjunction with Dave Kirkpatrick and, and Steve Lexon and, and with my wife, Tony, back in 1988, when we found these marvelous sites in this remote canyon. And the, the thing about the canyon that you have to know is it's hard to get into. It's, you can't get there now because of ownership, it's changed. But in the old days, you couldn't get there because it floods and there were Apaches and so on the old Spanish maps, what you see in the place of that canyon is Sal se puede, go if you can. And so we had an opportunity to go and by golly, we did. And it's gorgeous. You've got the high desert uh, next to the San Mateo Mountains with the Chihuahuan Desert pretty close. And the canyon has been blessed with a wonderful amount of water in this time of water need in New Mexico. This is one of those few places where water's coming up out of the ground and pouring down the canyon instead of out of it. 
Uh, it's, it's, it's just a remarkably beautiful place, particularly, of course, like the rest of the Southwest when it rains. But the source of this water is known locally as the Ojo Caliente, the Warm Spring. It was the name of the Warm Spring that gave the Eastern Band of the Cherkawa their name in the 1870s and 1880s because their reservation was there. And so the spring has made it a, a, a sacred and very special place for Native Americans and Europeans alike. And as I mentioned, even a little water draws a crowd in the Southwest. And because of the spring, the area contains Pueblo ruins, Apache camps, military posts that until 1999 went largely unexplored. Most of them are on private land and they still are. So I would advise you to look carefully to the lock gates and, the, and talk to people about going in there if you happen to decide to try. But in the fall of 1998, Dr. Dennis O'Toole telephoned and asked if HSR was interested in conducting an archeological project as he and his wife, Trudy, intended to purchase the property. And in, so in 1999, two nonprofit organizations, Human Systems Research and the newly fun, uh, founded Cañada Alamosa Institute joined forces to explore the history of human adaptation in relation to environmental change in the canyon. Project goals were to document changes in the local environment using the data gathered from studies of ge the geology, the soils, the plants, and the animal and plant remains from the archeological sites and the oral histories, and to correlate those data with documented changes in human adaptation derived from the archeological sites and the written and oral histories of the area. The project area includes the entire 728 square miles of the Rio Alamosa drainage from its headwaters to its confluence with the Rio Grande. The center of the project area is in Ecotone, which makes it a really interesting place to do research in. It's a place where the three environmental zones meet. The lowlands are the northwestern limits of the shrublands of the Chihuahuan Desert. A rise in elevation brings you to a verdant pinon juniper grassland, and finally to the majestic San Mateo Mountains with peaks over 10,000 feet. And I would point out that these are the other San Mateo Mountains, not the ones up by Grants. These are a second range of San Mateos that are farther south. And then under the shadow of Montoya Butte, which was a Native American shrine and probably still is, is a veritable oasis of farmable land and spring-fed creek, making this location a center of human activity for the last 2,000 years. And actually what we ended up finding out, it was 4,000 years at least. And four sites in this desert oasis were systematically tested from 1999 to 2011. The Rio Alamosa is located on a cultural frontier and border between the northern and southern Pueblos. Research has focused on how being on a frontier affected the lives and adaptations of the people. Did the groups move in and out, or did the locals simply borrow cultural traits from their neighbors? 16 years of field work and 25 years of laboratory research on the project have provided an answer to that question. Tonight, you see the results. Separated by 50 miles in the imposing Black Range from the Membrus Center, the Cañada Alamosa's position on a zone of interaction between the Mogollon and the Ancestral Pueblo resulted in a unique cultural sequence that reflects not only a variety of local interactions, but also changes in the respective centers, cultural centers, Membrus Valley, Chaco Canyon. The Cañada Alamosa is located in West Central New Mexico on a tributary to the Rio Grande. Its, its headwaters are in the southeastern corner of the plains of San Augustine. And three miles from this, uh, the, the, excuse me, fed by a deep aquifer, the Ojo Caliente or Warm Springs ensures a perennial flow of 2,000 gallons per minute into the canyon and towards the Rio Grande. 
Now what's happening here is the Rio Grande is a rift caused by the flashing of tectonic plates. And the edge of that rift is right along where this spring comes up. So the geologic action along the edge of the rift has forced this warm water up from about 1500 feet. And it's, it's warm water, it's not hot water. Uh, we took Boy Scouts there in February one year and they were all gonna go to the warm spring. We didn't join them, it's a little cool. But the canyon opens up about three miles down at the Monticello Box Ranch. And the subsurface water from the Eastern Slope creates a cienega um, that was once known as La Cienega de Victorio after the Apache leader. Over 13 years, five archaeological sites containing seven pit houses, seven pit house or Pueblo components spanning a thousand years were investigated. The components include the early and late pit house periods, followed by a series of Pueblo occupations, including Membrus phase, Socorro phase, Tularosa phase, Magdalena phase, and Glaze A. So this whole sequence runs for about, about 800 years. Back to the cultural frontier. It's located on the cultural frontier between the Northern and Southern Pueblo. Research has focused on how being a frontier affected, uh, affected the lives, uh, excuse me, Research on focused whether there was a permanent local population that borrowed material culture from both north or south, or whether populations from both areas moved in and out of the canyon. Chronometric dating of selected contexts and neutron activation analysis of ceramics were key to the analysis. Most of you are familiar with radiocarbon dating. Neutron activation analysis involves placing a ceramic sherd in a nuclear reactor and from the gases ex uh, extracted, determine the, the elemental signature of the clay and temper mixture that make up the ceramic. Ceramics with identical, with similar or identical signatures were most likely produced in the same area. In the case of Cañada Alamosa, NAA revealed that almost all painted ceramics were imported to the canyon regardless of period. And we ended up submitting uh, a few over 800 NAA samples to the general database in Missouri. And again, it's important to note that the Cañada Alamosa is located on that ecotone between the Chihuahuan Desert, the Mogollon Highlands, and the Colorado Plateau. The sites are on, an, are on that ecotone, and it, it's part of why it's such a mishmash, because so many different resources uh, come from different directions uh, into the canyon. So what happens on a frontier? Different researchers have, have, uh, have uh, taken a stab on it. There's been a lot of literature on frontiers and uh, it's the leading edge of contact and change between cultures. Frontiers are zones of interaction or their zones removed from the strictures of central places, which allow for the creation and recreation of social identity where new things happen. And also they are regions of refuge. They're places where people go to get away from everything else. This slide shows the approximate boundary between the ancestral Pueblo and Mogollon material culture between AD 650 and AD 900. Cañada Alamosa is located on the northeastern edge of the Mogollon pit house world. Cañada Alamosa boasts both late archaic and early pit house components. It is during the San Francisco phase that the material culture begins to vary from typical Mogollon sites. The Mogollon red on brown and Alma neck banded, typical of the San Francisco phase, are present in significant numbers. 
as are the utility wares that go with those. Uh, I want to make it clear, we did not find complete vessels like this. We were people on the edge of the world, just used all those ceramics down to the nubbins. We found mostly shirts. Uh, the ceramics from the Cañada Alamosa were used and reused until very little was left. And the NAA data tells us that the Mogollon Red on Brown was, for the most part, made and imported from the Gila and Mimbris production areas, with only a very little of it being made in the canyon. What makes the San Francisco phase in the Cañada Alamosa different is, is the presence of more than equal amounts of a type called San Marcel Black on White, uh, an early ancestral painted Pueblo where related in time and style to White Mound Black on White. The whole vessels shown here were found north and east of Magdalena. And to give you a little notion about San Marcel, it was it was defined by H.P. Mera way mm. back in the 30s, and it was defined from a site on the Rio Grande, but very little of it is actually on the lower Rio Grande. It's most of it's west of there or way up to the north. And it was a mystery then, and in 1974, my first student paper was the San Marcel black on white problem. And it took me 35 years to find a site with enough on it to make a difference. But here we are. So the NAA and uh, uh, petrographic data suggest that the San Marcel black on white found at Cañada Alamosa was produced on the east side of the Guayanas Mountains and imported 60 miles to Cañada Alamosa. And you can see looking at the graph that that's all the Mogollon red on brown and uh, San Marcel and uh, the San Marcel whitewares easily outpace it. So there was a lot of this whiteware coming down. What's curious is the utility wares that go with it weren't coming with it. Uh, uh, the utility wares we had were all Mogion utility wares. And then the architecture uh, also displays a mix of northern and southern traits with the ramp entrances typical of southern structures remodeled into ventilators, which are typical of northern pit structures. This occurred 100 years before ventilators are, are used commonly in the Membrus homeland in the Membrus Valley. And uh, I talked earlier about the possibility of intermarriage, or maybe that's going to come up between these groups. And I can just see some, some lady from up north coming down and say, nope, that's not the way we do it. That ventilator uh, or that ramp entrance really needs to be remodeled into a ventilator. Now, the succeeding period in time, the three circle phase from about 750 to 900, uh, we find members bullface black on white, but we never found where they were living. We never found a structure affiliated with it. All our members bullface is up in the upper levels of this uh, earlier pit house fill. And um, Maybe there are structures there somewhere, but we just didn't find them. The Victoria site where they were found is an awfully big site with a lot of room to, to hide a, a lot more secrets than we found. Now, the population density does diminish greatly during that period of time. Uh, the Membrus boldface black on white is, is being imported to Cañada Alamosa, uh, much like the Mogollon red on brown. Uh, but in contrast, the flow of northern whitewares has greatly diminished, and all we find is a small amount of red mesa black on white. So the period from um, 850 to 1000 saw the transition from pit houses to pueblos and was a time of low population at Cañada Alamosa as the population centers near Chaco and in the Membrus Valley begin to grow. A Bayesian analysis of radiocarbon dates from this era illustrates the gap in the pit house to Pueblo occupation at Cañada Alamosa. And I'm much indebted to both Miles Miller and Lori Barkwell Love for uh, doing the Bayesian analysis. Actually, one did it and then another one checked the work and they both came up with the same thing. And so thank you, folks.
In the 10th century, burgeoning populations in the northern and southern centers encouraged what has been referred to as the Pueblo II expansion, where populations from both northwestern and southwestern New Mexico expanded outward. And usually that term, which is a little bit passe now as things happen in archaeology, but uh, was the Pueblo II expansion was talking about northwestern New Mexico, but it applies equally to the Mimbres. Uh, those good good years in the uh, in the ten hundreds, the late eleventh century, uh, lots of rain and everything. The population grew, and people had to expand out to where there was a little bit of arable land, and that arable land was was made arable by the fact that th that was a period of intense rainfall. So then there's a uh, shift in the uh, Mogollon culture area, circa AD 1000. Uh, and the ancestral Pueblo villages to the west uh, in the reserve area intrude into territory previously occupied by three circle phase Mogollon pit house villages. And uh, the result defines the northern border for what is now known as the members culture area. And we could get into large arguments about whether that Cibola branch is really Mogollon or not. Uh, I tend to think that it's not. It got swamped by folks from the north. And uh, so, let's see. Canada Alamosa contains the northernmost member sites. Membrus classic black on white was imported into the canyon from the Gila and Membrus drainages, and after about AD 1060, from the new Membrus production area on the Rio Grande. That's, that's after the Membrus expanded into the Rio Grande in sufficient numbers to build big sites where they wanted to create their own pottery there. Membrus microstyles indicate a population influx from the Membrus area into the Canada Alamosa during the mid 11th century and a continued members presence into the 1120s and 1130s. There was considerable interaction between the Socorro phase population to the north and the members population in Canada and Canada Alamosa during the 11th, 11th century. And here's where I'm talking about a lot of trade. We find uh, the ceramics are are, are traded back and forth, and there's probably some intermarriage. And at the same time, uh, Chaco and uh, and Membrus are, are are doing quite well. But a significant drought from AD 1120 to 1140 stressed both populations and encouraged several Socorro phase villages from the Rio Salado to move to the better watered Cañada Alamosa. The Kelly Canyon site was constructed in classic Northern style with a linear arrangement of room blocks fronted by a midden and a kiva. Now I'm no statistician, but Socorro black on white is by far the dominant painted ceramic type at the Kelly Canyon site. I just love that graph. The distinctive fine corrugated utility wares the accompany us Socorro black on white are also present. And this is the Los Lunas smudge you see along the bottom of those really fine corrugations. Uh, Los Lunas smudged is the bowl form and Patochi rubbed ribbed is the jar form of that particular type also named by H.P. Mera back if back when. So investigations at the nearby Montoya site, which is right across the canyon from Kelly Canyon, revealed a clear and rapid transition from a members phase village to a Socorro phase village as the locals assimilated with the new population. And uh, the, the member structure burned and Within a very short period of time, the floor of that burn structure was used, or the, the roof of the burn structure was used as the floor of the next structure. The room was subdivided and reoccupied. 
So then the terminal P2 expansion set the stage for a reorganization of Pueblo culture uh, as both the Chaco and member systems collapse in the mid 1100s. By AD 1200, the Cañada Alamosa population aggr all aggregates at the Victorio site, which has over 400 rooms and which uh, and which continued to add on over the next 100 years, probably to make up that 400 rooms. The amazing thing is that in 1992, when we first went to Cañada Alamosa to record, a 400-room Pueblo had, had never been recorded. It was They left it for us. And so now uh, Cañada Alamosa and the Tularosa, the site is on the extreme southeastern corner of a world dominated by Tularosa black on white. The old ties to the south were effectively broken. Neutron activation indicates that the Tularosa black on white and St. John's polychrome were imported from the north and south, and neither of those types were ever produced in the canyon. There was also a tiny bit of trade wear coming in from the east. But shortened growing seasons and eventually drought in the San Juan culture area, forest movement of population south in the 1200s, and one of those migration corridors leads to Cañada Alamosa. The, uh, the shortened growing seasons uh, also shortened or narrowed the, the area in which crops could grow in terms of elevation in the north, and people had to start bailing out. Uh, at one time, they suggest there were 40,000 people in the Four Corners area. And a lot of people looked to the great drought as when they moved, but uh, data suggests that that movement started uh, fairly soon into the 1200s and then continued over time. The migrant group constructed a terraced village on an uplift located just one half mile from the 400 plus Victoria site. Referred to as the pinnacle, it was the focus of six field seasons led by Dr. Stephen Lexon at the University of Colorado. And here we see the terraces defined by the morning light. Uh, Devin White uh, took this photo. He was a graduate student for Steve at the time, and it really picks up all the terracing on that hill. And there were a lot of flat areas that they could have built on, but instead they picked a defensive uh, area that they could uh, protect themselves on. The compound masonry and carbon painted McElmo style ceramics known as Magdalena black on white differentiate this site from the Victoria site and all other sites in the canyon. The source for Magdalena black on white was the Guyana Springs Pueblo 60 miles to the north, although we have found some small bit of local production at Cañada Alamosa. There was a lot of talk when Steve came along, uh, Steve Lexon came along and he proposed that, hey, we've got carbon paint, ceramics, we've got populations uh, from the north intruding into the Mogollon world in southern New Mexico, southwestern New Mexico. And of course, all the naysayers came forward as, as we do, we, we have to debate the issues. And one of the one of the arguments brought forth is, no, it's just the Tularosa phase folks simply stop doing Tularosa phase, uh, Tularosa black on white and, and started doing carbon paint and they changed their architecture to this nice uh, slab stuff. And they all moved over on a defensive hill and these sites are actually sequential. Well, we have a lot of radiocarbon dates and the data pretty clearly show that these two sites were contemporary between 1250 and 1280. So we had neighbors on the Cañada Alamosa with very different, uh, probably very different social systems or somewhat different social systems and probably a different language. Uh, the social boundaries are reflected in the distribution of the decorated ceramics. Uh, on the Victoria site, we only came up with five carbon paint shirts in six or seven years of, of testing. And in, on the Pinnacle, we only had like 20 shirts of Tularosa and they were all down in the bottom of a midden 
from very early in the in the occupation. And what this is is a microcosm of relationships that were defined by John Roney of the carbon paint sites that are on the Rio Puerco with the Tularosa phase or Coino Coino phase is what Ditter called them on the Cibuyota Mesa and the Rio San Jose. And you have the same thing going on. You've got these two, two sets of sites, one with using carbon paint, one with mineral paint. They're next to each other. They're not trading much at all. They're not talking to each other, at least in any way we can see in the material culture. And so what we're seeing to the south is just a little, a, a little example of a much bigger pattern from farther north. So the 14th century on the Rio Alamosa, um, both sites are abandoned by circa AD 1300. The pinnacle is reoccupied by a glaze period occupation that ends in the late 1300s. Glaze wares include both Western and Rio Grande types. And then the very last sites in the in the canyon are slightly later glazed period pueblos that are located up by the warm spring three miles up canyon and we did not have opportunity to test either one of those but uh, they remain a uh, something for somebody to do someday but the ceramics from the surface suggest that they they were two were abandoned by ad 1400 and um so thus ended a millennia of interaction, exchange, aggregation, and abandonment on the Cañada Alamosa. Two factors probably influenced the lack of additional Pueblo occupation in the canyon. For one, the onset of the Little Ice Age in the later 1300s created cooler and wetter conditions not seen since the early years of the first millennium as well as a potential shift away from the monsoonal precipitation that may have affected traditional farming practices. Second, the Apache were almost certainly in the area by circa AD 1400, but that's another story for another time. Thank you very much. Thank you. What a fascinating presentation. Um, and I see that you have a lot of fans out there and we welcome your questions uh, or comments at this time. And I'll do my best to, to read those. You can start with mine in the chat, Monica. Okay. Um, you had mentioned earlier, Alan, that on the map of the 400 plus room Victoria site, um, that there are structures, that the structures that are shown are just the ones that were excavated during the, or you're asking, I guess, if those are the ones that were just excavated during the Cañada Alamosa project. Yeah, that uh, map. This is this is the map, and uh, this the the blue dots show where we had excavations. Uh, we didn't. We only excavated about three complete rooms. Most of our efforts were to uh, uh, to find a, a hearth to extract something that we could get a chronometric date on and a sample of the ceramics and the macro botanical remains. And so I think that we ended up with 39, 39 excavated areas on the Victorio site. Uh, two of those were wiki ups, uh, three of four of those were pit structures and the rest of them were portions of rooms with the exception of a couple of middens that we tested. So we went over it pretty lightly. There's a lot of archeology span still there. Um, there are several comments that have been submitted uh, thanking you and um, expressing how informative this 
presentation was. How great. Thank you. Terrific. Um, Ron Washburn says, this is amazing. This was amazing. Thank you for putting this on. Um, Audrey um, Espinosa uh, says, this is a fascinating explanation of mobility among groups and potential intermarriage in some cases. It contrasts older information about these communities being self-contained and all dying off as we were taught years ago. Ken Stinnett says, thanks for clearing that up. Great work, great info. Thanks, Carl. Um, question, what evidence do you have for Apaches being in the area as early as the 1400s? We have, um, uh, we recovered 162,000 sherds ceramics off of the Victoria, well, from the entire project. And the Victoria site probably had 100,000 plus of those. And we looked at every one of them. And we did a big surface collection in 2005. And we found three sherds, not together, they're, they're separate vessels, but there are three sherds of Zuni buffware, which is produced in the 1400s. And it's later than anything else we have on that site. It doesn't belong in association with the other ceramics. The other sherd that we found was a sherd of San Lazaro glazed polychrome from the Galisteo Basin. Uh, Denny Seymour and others, uh, some, of, some of my work as well, has demonstrated that when the Apaches could get their hands on Pueblo pottery, they took it to their sites. And so you'll find a, a little palimpsest of, of Pueblo pottery on some of these, these early Apache sites. Uh, and then linked with that, I guess is my own personal bias, is at a very different location on White Sands Missile Range, I excavated in the Gabi roasting pit at the mouth of Himbrio Canyon. And the primary use of that pit was in the 1600s, but there's no indication that any of it was Pueblo. It was all probably Apache or, or at least a proto-historic group, but I think it was Apache. And we had one radiocarbon date that at two standard devi deviations, and it was a radiocarbon date on Agave, at two standard deviations, it was earlier than 1440. So the, the, the evidence is slight, but um, I'm not discounting it. Uh, the earlier you go with Apaches, the harder it is to find them. Drew Stewart uh, submitted a question. He asks, are there rock sites in Cañada? If so, does the iconography speak to, cult to cultural influences or affiliations? The rock art? Yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we we do have rock art. Uh, a lot of it is is associated with Montoya Butte in, in different places. Uh, Marglyph, uh, uh, Margaret Barrier has an article in a recent uh, Hornado conference volume on the Cañada Alamosa rock art. But we have uh, at least four or five distinct temporal associations that we think we can draw from it. There's a very early pit house material from up near the uh, uh, blanket figures and that sort of stuff up near the top. Um, there are, uh, there is a classic, we called her the screaming woman, but it's a woman giving birth, uh, painted in red, and it's exactly like a couple of Similar images from membrous bowls, whether they're birthing images or not, is open for debate, but the images are the same. This one is clearly membrous. Um, we have some late uh, uh, headdress figures in a grotto that probably uh, that look a lot like material from the Galisteo Basin or the Rio Grande. And then we have 
one of the most interesting things we have is is Apache, and again, early Apache, and we were only able to see this with a uh, uh, an extraction uh, technique uh, that they use with it to get to a camera to increase contrast and the uh, de-stretch. And there was a, a little gun, a, a mountain spirit, maybe just a few inches high, holding a bow and arrow, pointing it in one toward another figure. And the other figure was just a rectangle with a, a little round circle at one end of it. And kind of like you'd, uh, uh, oh, kind of like a medicine bottle or something like that. It, it was real, didn't look like anything. It was a rectangle with a, like a head above it, maybe like somebody in a sleeping bag with their head sticking out. Um, and so we were looking at that, uh, when Margliff and I were, were working with it. And I remembered that Alan Ferg had given me, a, with one of his wonderful books on Apache playing cards. And, uh, it turns out that that rectangle with the circle on top is one of an early example of a Ray figure, a King figure that the Apaches used on their, their playing cards. And being it's associated with a gaan, I think that's what we're looking at. So long story, but there it is. Mark Reno asks, is there any hope of getting back into Warm Springs to do further research? Uh, there's always hope. Um, the times, times will change and, and situations will change. Um, my personal take on it is we have so much data that it's taken everything we have to, to, to get this written up. So, uh, down, but I, you know, down the road, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that it's, it's over with. It's just that that was an era and there will be another one someday. And I hope there is. And the other thing that I wanted to point out is that the collections uh, 450 office boxes uh, are at the Hibben Center at the University of New Mexico. They have a home, and uh, we have spent a lot of time cataloging them. And so there are all kinds of of roads for graduate students from UNM to to dive into those boxes and 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 then tell us how wrong we were or how right we were or find out new things from this because we're finding out we're we're learning something new every day and and we're almost hopefully done with this um brad millet it, um says sir will you please go back over when the site was no longer in use and what the reasoning was again i heard you mention apaches in the area but they were not the reason of the departure Well, I believe, and, and, you know, I mean, we believe things, we, we think things, we have hypotheses about how things work. The migrants that came to Pinnacle got there at about the beginning of the great drought. And the Victoria site was aggregating at the same time. So people were coming in and joining the Victoria site. On the Victoria site in the south side of the Arroyo, we have what we call the suburbs. And uh, the room blocks there are a little more scattered than they are on the other side of the Arroyo. And they weren't there for as long. You don't have the same amount of cultural litter, uh, sherds and what have you. Some of some of them weren't even built with foundations. They were just built on the ground. Um, and so I don't think those people were there very long. And I think it was all during the Great Drought. And I think the Great Drought, which ended about 1290 or so, kind of wore out the populations in the Cañada Alamosa. Uh, you know, you have all that water going down that canyon, and that's a wonderful thing. But I've hunted deer in that canyon in a drought year, and I've been up in the in the uplands. And uh, in a non-drought year, there's lots of deer, 
rabbits everywhere, all kinds of game, lots of things going on. In a drought year, we were lucky to see one horny toad and one roadrunner. And so you can have all the water you want to. And I use this as an analogy for what's happening in New Mexico right now. You can have all the water coming out of the taps you want to, but if that exter external environment does not have enough water, you're dependent on those outside resources. You can't live on just the canyon alone. And if you had a population at the Pinnacle and at Victorio, both utilizing the same resources, there had to have been some stress. So I'm thinking that's why everybody picked up about 1290. Uh, we do have one little room block of two rooms of somebody that came back or hung on, one of the two, on the Victoria site. And then the, uh, the glaze occupation, uh, there's a very short period, short window of, of abandonment where all the, the rooms on the slope of the pinnacle uh, got material washed in on top of them and some vegetation grew. We found some environmental evidence that yeah, the, the stuff washed into the room and vegetation grew there for a while. And then it's on top of that that we get the glazed material. So there was an abandonment and a reoccupation, at least in my view. Uh, Steve Lexon might have a slightly different view on that. But uh, the people that came back, well, if the, if the environment changed and, and, and the rains came again and, you know, the, and everybody else had left and you still had all that water, well, that made it a pretty good place to come back to. Cynthia says, look forward to discussing this study area with the sites we have in Elephant Butte area. I will email you soon, JC. Uh, Robert Delo Russo, Carl, fascinating effort at Cañada Alamosa. I always wondered about the ties between there and the Galinas Pueblo, Goat Spring Pueblo also. Thanks. And he isn't, he's out of Montana. Um, Mark Calamia. Great presentation, Carl. Thank you. Did you observe variation in projectile point styles or other lithic tools that could be correlated with changes in ceramic types of particular of particular cultural periods or phases? We did. Uh, Brian Halstead did that analysis. And uh, there is a, a very, I think we had six to 700 projectile points and a very nice sequence from the pit house period uh, into early Pueblo, into late Pueblo and, and so on. And, and actually even some Apache points, very similar to those found at Cerro Rojo uh, on Fort Bliss by, by Denny Seymour. And they were, they were very nicely located next to the Wikiups. So, so yes, we do, we do have a projectile point sequence. William Lucius asks, when will the final reports be published? That's what they keep asking. Uh, <laughs> as soon as we can get it done, we're, we're human systems research after 52 years. I guess we're in our, yeah, we're in our 52nd year this year. Um, is closed its contract doors last year. And that has allowed me the freedom to just work on Cañada Alamosa. And so we're, we're shooting to have a draft document by August or very soon thereafter. And I'm, I'm, I'm uh, busily uh, trying to interact uh, with some presses to see if anybody's interested. And if not, we'll, we'll do it like we've always done, do it on our own. Frank Brito asks, what is the elevation here? 6,000 feet, right at the Victoria site. Mm -hmm. And Jean is asking, is there a temporal gap of occupation before evidence of Apaches? It's hard to tell. The, the Apache signature is so, that early Apache signature is so weak, you just don't know. And the the late occupation of the pueblos the because we don't have any dates to cap it 
uh, the Bayesian, anal Bayesian analysis of the occupation, the late occupation on Pinnacle sort of drifts into the middle to, to late 1300s, but we can't be sure when it ends. Marilyn asks if there was any corn found and dated. Of the 65, we got 64 radiocarbon dates. 20 of those are associated with a climatic reconstruction that we haven't even that I haven't talked about at all tonight in any in any detail and the other 40 dates are all corn dates with one exception from the sites and the exception was a mistake we thought it was a corn cupule but it wasn't <laughs> But they are, they're all they're all corn dates. We sent in forty nine uh, tree ring dates, tree ring samples, and none of them none of them made a date. Uh, there is a tree ring sequence for the San Mateo Mountains that goes back to the six hundreds, uh, but we weren't able to match any of that. And then from the Victoria site, we were also able to obtain, I think, eight or ten archaeomag dates. And they paired up very nicely, I might add, with our radiocarbon dates. Uh, Michael asks, were the Pueblos single story and any Kiva structures found? What was the last? Um, if uh, any Kiva structures that were found? There are, there's one structure on Kelly Canyon that I am absolutely certain was a Kiva, is a Kiva. Uh, there are three structures in the pit house period on Victorio that might be sequential Kivas, which would be interesting. Uh, there is one dance floor situation with a big berm around it that may have been a Tularosa phase communal area, uh, maybe not but not an excavated kiva. And then one of the structures on the Montoya site that was burned may have been a kiva. Uh, based based on its its size and shape and and the fact that it was burned. Were were the Pueblos single story? And Yes, for the most part. Now, there is the one large room block on the Victorio site that the architect suggested had a central wall, a double heavy central wall that would have been capable of supporting a, a second structure. And and maybe, maybe there was, a, but we did not find the floors or the collapsed double ceilings or any of that when we when we worked in that structure. Now, it had been impacted already by pot hunters. So that was a little more difficult. On the pinnacle, that pinnacle, uh, there are there are standing walls completely hidden from above the ground that are two meters high. And so, yeah, there could be a, a second story somewhere in there, but uh, but not where we worked. Carol asked, "Did you identify any agricultural features?" We did. Uh, we've got um, two master's theses, one by Josh Farr and another by Antonio de, de Cunzo. And they were both st master's students from Eastern New Mexico University under Phil Shelley. And uh, Josh looked at lower terraces and he found deposits uh, with old field areas. Uh, and he ex was able to extract, uh, Dr. Uh, Rick Holloway did the extraction and he had both corn and squash pollen uh, from that truncated field area. Did, most of it had been washed away. And then up on the Victorio Terrace itself, where the Victorio site is, uh, Tony uh, DeCunzo, was looking at water control features coming off some of the room blocks over in the suburbs that are up next to the slope. 
And so he tested the water control features or whatever they are, these lines of rock coming off the rooms and didn't find any kind of pollen at all, nothing that was useful. So, but he had a control sample about halfway up the slope. Well, the control sample was full of corn pollen. And so we went back up uh, after he finished his thesis and we did a grid around there and we extracted more pollen. And uh, and yeah, there's, there's a field area up there. And then when I was walking the site, one of the last few times that I walked the site with, uh, with Dr. John Sandor, and, uh, Sandor's did a lot of work in the Membrus looking at water control features and ag little agricultural features. And we just had the one day up there. But as we walked along the edge of the slope just above the suburbs, he said, oh, look at there. There's a pile of rocks. And then there's another pile of rocks. And there, there are field markers. And so those were our two stabs at uh, one high and one low at agricultural fields. Jane asks, how many early pit house uh, sites are in your inventory and how big are they? And we're talking here in the site survey inventory. None of them, well, with the exception, the Victoria site pit house village is, is pretty good sized. Whether it's all contemporary or not is another question. Um, I would say at its max, it might have had 20 or 30 pit houses. The other pit houses that I've seen, the sites are smaller and they're up and down the canyon. Uh, but uh, there's still a lot of work to be done there. Uh, a lot to see. We surveyed down canyon and uh, our early surveys were all up canyon. And then I interviewed ranchers and uh, and got a another look at the things, and then uh, Carrie Thomas did a, uh, a a master's in geography, and for her master's thesis, we have a predictive model of sites in the study area based on all the variables she could pull together and on the sites that were known in the area at that time. John Welsh thanks you. And he says, this effort and your work in general exemplify local and regional cultural history at its finest, using all available data to address all pertinent questions. Um, Mark asks, were contemporary Pueblo or Apache peoples consulted during the excavations and the resulting interpretations for cultural and population shifts in the Cañada Alamosa? Consultation would be probably too strong of a word, but we, we, had, we invited uh, Peter Pino from Zia to come visit the sites and uh, talk to us about his concerns. Uh, unfortunately, we lost him during COVID. Uh, and then the uh, Mescalero Apache uh, had several trips to the canyon uh, to talk about the history and, and what we were doing with the sites. Um, Alan asks, uh, says, you mentioned possible, possibly sequential occupation of three potential kivas and that at least one possible kiva was burned. Did you find any evidence of ritual closure of the possible kivas? Mm. In the pit house period ones, no other than the burning. And in that one, that one was 2.2 meters deep and it was covered by a tularosa phase room up top. And we we got a wonderful uh, archaeomag date. It was the very first one that we got. Uh, and all eight cubes came in between 730 and 750 AD. Uh, doesn't get much better than that. Uh, Eric Blinman took the samples. I don't remember anything left on the floor, anything of that nature. The next one, we got an archaeomag date that went Late eight, late seven hundreds into the early eight hundreds, 
And that's when I started suspecting that maybe we were looking at different communal structures at different periods. In terms of ritual closure, closure the site on the Montoya site, the, the room on the Montoya site that I think may have been a member's kiva that was uh, later subdivided and lived in by Tularosa phase folks. Uh, there was one small, beautiful, polished Alma Plain uh, miniature bowl or jar uh, down on that floor. And maybe that was a ritual closure. We found that little jars like that in two or three other rooms. And we're considering each one of those situations as possible ritual closure. Okay, I'm not seeing any other um, questions or comments, but you you did get, like I said, you do have a lot of fans out there and a lot of thanks um, expressed. Well, I, and I thank them, and I thank them for putting up with my my kind <laughs> of hesitant uh, Zoom production here. But I haven't done this too often, but uh, kind of rattled along there. It was very informative. Thank you um, to all of you out there that joined us. Um, another uh, plea to consider um, donating to Old Pueblo Archaeology to support help support its uh, education programs. And thank you all for attending this evening. And um, and Denny says, thanks, Carl. Enjoyed it. Very interesting. And uh, we thank you, Carl, for being with us this evening and sharing your time. Well, and I thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Thank you, everybody. Everybody have a good evening. Bye now.